Families and friends reunited and outdoor sport is back. England begins the lifting of lockdown. The stay-at-home message has been relaxed and we're even allowed to meet in groups of up to six. For many, it really is Happy Monday. I can't define it in words as to what I've felt when I've seen my family after so long. I definitely value these relationships more, more now because I've seen that how difficult it is to live without. From the government though, some words of warning amidst the optimism. What we don't know is exactly how strong our fortifications now are, how, how robust our uh, defences are against uh, an, another wave. So it's not quite back to business as usual just yet, but it is a start. We're out in the spring sunshine as England enjoys. Also on the programme tonight in the US, the trial begins of the police officer accused of the murder of George Floyd. And... Released after six days and billions of dollars in delayed trade, the ship stuck in the Suez Canal is free. From Hyde Park, this is the ITV Evening News with Mary Nightingale. Good evening from Hyde Park in central London where the sun is out and uh, so are hundreds of people all enjoying the first day of easing of lockdown in England. Now the stay at home rule has been relaxed and from today two households or groups of up to six people can meet outside. Outdoor sport is allowed again too and it doesn't just feel like we're finally turning a corner in this horrible pandemic. In Leeds, people have been taking advantage of some fine weather to enjoy their local parks. In Leicester, the tennis is back on, as is golf and many other sports and activities. And what a day to enjoy being at the beach again, like Western Supermare in Somerset. There was, though, a timely reminder from the Prime Minister and the government's chief scientist to keep following the social distancing rules and not ruin all the good efforts we've put in so far. And we'll have more on that in just a moment. But first, here's Paul Davis on Family and Friends Reunited. A nation that's known so many dark days and had to live with so many rules and restrictions woke up to something a little bit better. Across England, the new day brought the return of some old freedoms. There was even some welcome sunshine as the relaxation of COVID regulations meant the Jaju and Mashweri families could meet face to face in a North London garden. A simple pleasure only appreciated when it was taken away. Imagine not meeting your brother for months and months, living just down the road, still you can't see them. It's been tough, definitely, last four or five months. Really tough. I can't define it in words as to what I've felt when I've seen my family after so long. I definitely value these relationships more, more now, because I've seen that how difficult it is to live without. Across England, families and friends have been reunited, a step Scotland and Northern Ireland will follow next week. For some, not so much a reunion, but an introduction. In Bedfordshire, baby Bella here, born during lockdown, is meeting family for the first time. Absolutely lovely. Obviously, I can't have a cuddle, but that, that, I don't mind. I've seen her. That's important to me. Feet are nicely apart. Outdoor exercise is back on the agenda. Few more enthusiastic than the early morning Tai Chi class at Swaddlingcote in Derbyshire. The start to a beautiful new freedom, I hope. Still within the rules, still socially distanced, but really enjoying it. They were queuing before 8am for the outdoor swimming pool at Hathersedge in the Peak District. The sun hadn't yet put in an appearance when the covers were removed, but that didn't seem to matter after months of lockdown. I feel like I've won the lottery. <laughs> it's been... It's being cooked up is not good. Not good for physical health, mental health, anything. Feels amazing. Amazing. There will continue to be restrictions, 
But today is a significant milestone on the road back to normality, one that brings with it a much needed feel good factor and an appreciation of some things like the company of those we care for and were probably guilty of taking for granted. <laughs> Paul Davis, ITV News. So here are the rule changes for England in more detail. Now, as the stay at home rule lifts, people are now allowed to meet in groups of up to six or as two households in parks and gardens. Football and cricket pitches are reopening, as well as tennis courts, golf courses, and outdoor swimming pools. And organised team sports can start again outside. Weddings can also now start again with up to six guests, but people should still work from home wherever possible. And the stay at home order has been replaced now with stay local instead. If it all goes to plan and infection rates don't rise, we should be on track for the next stage on the 12th of April, which would see non-essential shops, beauty services, gyms and outdoor hospitality reopening. And there was a cautionary tone, though, today from the Prime Minister as he gave his first COVID news conference from Downing Street's new multi-million pound media briefing room. Boris Johnson said it is not clear how well protected the UK is from the third wave sweeping across mainland Europe. He underlined how vital it is that everyone gets vaccinated. So let's have a look at the latest data, which showed that 4,654 new infections in the UK. And there were 23 further deaths, continuing the big fall over the past week. And more than 30 million people have had their first dose of vaccine. Here's our political correspondent, Carl Dinnan, on the call for caution. A little red heart to represent each life lost to COVID. Bereaved families are drawing them on the embankment wall opposite Parliament. They say their memorial will eventually be more than half a kilometre long. So, speaking from his new briefing room today, the Prime Minister struck a careful tone. I know how much it will have meant to millions of people to have joined someone else for a cup of tea in the garden. And I must stress that it's only because of months of sacrifice and effort that we can take this small step towards freedom today and we must proceed with caution. There's a great sense of release around the country today with the lifting of some restrictions. Uh, do you worry at all that uh, people might take that too far? What we don't know is exactly how strong our fortifications now are, how, how robust our uh, defences are uh, against uh, an, another wave. What we do know is that the lifting of restrictions in England today will cause some more infections. There is a high likelihood that there will be some uptick as a result of the uh, um, relaxations today and that was anticipated right from the beginning of trying to lay out where the roadmap would go. Provided people stick to outdoors and at a distance if it's people who are not in their households, the impact on, in terms of an uptick should be modest. The government has updated its messaging today to remind people of the importance of ventilation. Hands, face, space and fresh air. But could the government itself be doing more? I think the single biggest risk is, of course, what we're seeing happening in other countries where the numbers are still going up. And one of my primary concerns is that uh, under the government scheme, only 1% of those coming from abroad is quarantining. Um, and that seems wrong. We should have a comprehensive scheme for quarantining. There is palpable concern within government about the rising tide of infections in Europe. So although restrictions are easing around the UK this week, the prospect of a summer holiday on some foreign beach is still highly uncertain. Carl Dinan, ITV News, Westminster. And our political editor, Robert Peston, joins me now. Look, Rob, this is all very welcome. Sun's out. It's lovely. But there is a certain amount of jeopardy for the Prime Minister here, isn't there? There is. And what really struck me is that although the data is definitely moving in the right direction, he and his scientific advisers were remarkably cautious. Chris Whitty said, even if you've had both jabs, don't hug your children and grandchildren because he says there's still a risk. Uh, you know, the Prime Minister says don't take it for absolute granted that the roadmap uh, of opening is going to proceed exactly on time. He also said 
which, you know, sort of classic Boris Johnson, he said, no, he doesn't want there ever to be another lockdown. But in the end, that's our responsibility, not his. He wants us to follow the rules. And his broad message is if we don't follow the rules, there will be another lockdown. He's constantly pointing to the surge in infections on the other side of the channel and saying, you know, we've got to protect ourselves because last time they had a surge, we suffered too. But if I'm honest, and as you just pointed out, uh, the sun is shining. It's lovely to be out in a park. It's lovely to have great company. So I, for one, I'm quite cheerful. Yeah, I think we all are. For today, thank you, Robert. Thanks very much indeed. Well, the lifting of some restrictions in England came just two days after some of the rules were also relaxed. In Wales, thousands of people poured onto beaches and mountain beauty spots there after travel restrictions were lifted within the country. And the next review of lockdown measures in Wales is due this Thursday. A relaxing of the rules in Scotland will begin on Friday when the stay-at-home order there will end in favour of stay local again before hairdressers and garden centres reopen next week. While in Northern Ireland, up to six people or two households will be able to meet outdoors from Thursday. And we will have all the details of what you can and perhaps more importantly what you can't do across the UK on our website. That's itv.com forward slash news. So, moving on there, and although the vaccination programme is going well across the UK, it did emerge today that the take-up is very patchy among minority ethnic groups. Figures from the Office for National Statistics show that in England, over 70s of black African heritage are more than seven times more likely not to have received their first dose of vaccine. Our health editor Emily Morgan reports on the concerns that the message just isn't getting through. My parents have had the vaccine. My mum has had the vaccine. There is a worrying trend that those disproportionately affected by COVID are shunning the very thing that will protect them. Taking the vaccine is the only way to boost your immunity against COVID for you and your loved ones. Numerous campaigns have been launched to try to turn this around, but four months in and poor vaccine take-up is still a problem. It's even dividing families. My daughter, she's no, she, she's not sure if she has to take it. She's only 22. I didn't want to have it, to be perfectly honest, because of, I just, maybe like people in certain communities that feel mistrust. ONS data reveals in the over 70s, the lowest vaccination rates were among the black African population with 58% uptake. Only 68% of those identifying as black Caribbean were vaccinated and those from Bangladeshi backgrounds were the next least likely to have it. That compared to 91% in white British. Rates also differed with religious affiliation. Muslims had the lowest uptake at 72%, followed by Buddhists. I was just calling about your COVID vaccine. Most of Dr. Hussein's patients are from ethnic minorities. She's only managing to persuade 20% of those who are hesitant to change their mind. A lot of the um, South Asians are concerned about still that there are animal products. Infertility seems to be a big myth as well. And I think for a lot of my black Africans, maybe, you know, understandably, they're, con they're concerned about what's happened in the past, history of being, you know, guinea pigs and tested on things that aren't safe. It's why vaccine buses that tour areas with low rates are so important. In Greenwich alone, we've seen a 20% increase in the uptake of the vaccine in black African and black Caribbean communities, and I think that's fantastic. That may be so, but as lockdown eases further, there are fears certain communities are still very much at risk. Emily Morgan, ITV News. It's come the ITV Evening News. Finally free, the huge container ship that was stuck in the Suez Canal is on the move. And saying I do in front of a few, as the easing of rules allows weddings with up to six people. But before that, the family of George Floyd have told ITV News they are hoping for justice as the trial of the police officer accused of his murder got underway in the United States. Prosecutors played the disturbing and shocking video of George Floyd's final moments to the court and said that the officer, Derek Chauvin, had betrayed his badge. From the hearing in Minneapolis, here's our US correspondent, Emma Murphy. All right, what's your name? George. George? George Perry Floyd. There was a time George Floyd's name was not globally known. 
Spell it for me. G E O. <laughs> but these yep. were the final moments right. of that obscurity. Last name? Floyd. Before his life ebbed away beneath the knee of a police officer. And before his name became synonymous with one of the most troubled times in the history of the United States. October 14th. Today, a jury began considering its judgment of this man, Derek Chauvin, accused of abusing his power to hold George Floyd beneath his knee for more than eight minutes. No longer a man of uniform nor freedom, he faces murder and manslaughter charges, accused of using lethal force without cause. Mr. Derek Chauvin betrayed this badge. He put his knees upon his neck and his back grinding and crushing him until the very breath, no ladies and gentlemen, until the very life, were squeezed out of him. The events leading to the death of George Floyd in May last year were filmed extensively. From the moment a shopkeeper told police they thought he'd passed a counterfeit note to his pleas that he couldn't breathe. Much of it filmed by passers-by who warned police that Mr. Floyd was dying. However, Derek Chauvin's defense team say George Floyd did not die from the pressure on his neck. The evidence will show that Mr. Floyd died of a cardiac arrhythmia that occurred as a result of hypertension, his coronary disease, the ingestion of methamphetamine and fentanyl, and the adrenaline throwing flowing through his body. That is disputed by the Floyd family, who told me they believe they will get a conviction where others failed. I'm expecting by just looking at the video, I'm expecting to get a conviction. I'm expecting to get justice for my brother. To highlight how long Mr. Floyd was on the ground, his family and lawyers took the knee outside court. America's founding fathers argued that all men are created equal. His name, George Floyd. His name, George Floyd. This trial will question if America still lives by that premise. In the months after George Floyd's death, around 26 million people took to the streets of this country to protest. They were largely peaceful. But this is America's moment of reckoning. Can the justice system deliver equality and fairness irrespective of race? Much rests on the outcome of this court case, which we're expecting in around four weeks' time. Emma Murphy in Minneapolis, thank you very much indeed. Well, here, the Education Secretary, Gavin Williamson, says the growing allegations of sexual assault and harassment made by current and former pupils of private schools are shocking and abhorrent. Thousands of claims have been made online, and one police chief constable has urged parents to report their sons if they suspect they may have committed a sexual assault. And a warning, this report from our UK editor, Paul Brand, contains distressing testimonies. The ribbons are a symbol of the accusations now attached to many schools. Educate your sons, read the signs, but interrogate them too, say police, as today they called on parents to report any child suspected of abusing or harassing others. If a son makes a disclosure about the fact that they've committed a criminal offence, I, I think this is where the values of, of those parents really come to the fore. And they should then be making that disclosure. They should be getting contact with their local police forces. Today, police and the government promised a helpline to report allegations, with over 8,000 now posted on this website, where students have been telling their stories. I was sexually harassed by a member of my class for a year, and I didn't tell anyone for six months. A boy in my year joke strangled me to get me to kiss him, and then pushed me onto the floor and climbed on top of me. A boy in my year at school raped me. It's genuinely awful to still see him every day. Many of those testimonies are from private school pupils now going public. Ava wrote to one head teacher in London last week detailing alleged abuse. There were rankings of body parts being shouted out across school corridors and across classrooms. And it really begs the question there that not only is this culture incredibly pervasive, but how proud are we of this culture and how much complicity is there from everyone around? Some are asking if schools are part of the problem. 
Do you think some schools have covered this up to protect their reputations and their commercial interests? I think it's really important to say that there is actually no evidence of that. Nobody's going to be more keen than schools to ensure that everybody is safe and happy and flourishes. But the ribbons on railings speak of a scandal in which schools are increasingly entangled. Paul Brand, ITV News. A worried mother has made a public appeal to help find her son, who has been missing now for a week. 19-year-old student Richard Dokorege from West London has sickle cell disease. His mother said he was struggling to cope with university pressures and had been shielding during lockdown. Richard is believed to have left his family home in West London seven days ago. Now, the giant container ship which was blocking the Suez Canal has finally been freed. The Ever Given was dislodged by tugboats after being stuck for nearly a week. It has delayed billions of pounds worth of goods and formed a jam of hundreds of ships. Martha Fairley has more. Heralded by a fanfare of horns, the Ever Given is afloat at last. This colossus of the shipping world, now arguably the most famous of container ships, is sailing in a slow and careful procession along the Suez Canal, surrounded by a flotilla of tugboats. But it is still under tow from the salvage team that rescued the vessel after it became wedged across this narrow but vital shipping lane. It's almost a week since the Ever Given first got stuck. Overnight, engineers partially refloated it, but it was still blocking traffic. The rescue effort focused on dredging mud and sand from around the ship, while tugboats pulled it when last night's full moon high tide raised water levels. This afternoon, it was finally freed. It's now being escorted to the Great Bitter Lake for a technical inspection. The backlog of waiting ships has cost over £6.5 billion a day to global trade. On the banks of the Suez Canal, where the Ever Given's cargo had become part of the landscape for six days, a small crowd gathered, witnessing for themselves the passing of this 220,000-tonne ship. But the canal remains closed to other traffic while damage to the banks is assessed to ensure that ships and the valuable cargoes they carry can flow freely once again. Martha Fairley, ITV News. And finally tonight, spring is in the air and for some, love is too. Weddings are now allowed in England, although only small ceremonies with, of course, a maximum of six people. Even so, many couples are jumping at the chance, finally, to get hitched. Stacey Foster was with one very happy bride and groom in Newcastle under Lyme. Would the congregation please stand? It was a much smaller celebration than Oliver and Danielle originally planned. And because of Covid, the bride had to walk herself down the aisle with her father two metres behind. Isn't it wonderful to be able to celebrate with Oliver and Danielle today in the midst of this difficult time? This is one of the first weddings allowed since the latest lockdown. And with only six people, including the bride and groom, allowed in person, the rest tuned in online. By the joining of hands and by the giving and receiving of rings, I therefore proclaim that they are husband and wife. And while you are allowed to seal a marriage with a kiss, the signing of the registers requires your own pen. There were many traditions of a church wedding, but for this couple, getting married on the 29th of March was non-negotiable. It means so much to us to get married before our son arrives. That is the main consideration, I think. Yeah. We didn't think it was going to be possible to be able to get married before he comes. Yeah, and with the due date only being six weeks away, um, we wondered if Boris's plans would keep getting pushed back or anything like that. So yeah. we just selected the date and went for it. The vicar was on hand to help as official photographer at the first wedding here since September. And if we could just get a photo with close family, please. <laughs> but with reception still banned until next month, Oliver and Danielle's wedding breakfast was a socially distanced afternoon toast in the garden. 
They've spent 95% less on this wedding day, but it couldn't mean any more. Stacey Foster, ITV News, Newcastle and Lyme. And that is all for now from Hyde Park, where the sun is still shining. And there really is a feeling that things just may be starting to change for the better. Today saw the next stage of the lifting of lockdown in England and the roadmap looks on track for further easing in the coming weeks. And there should be even brighter days ahead, dare we hope. Tom will be here with news at 10. But from me and all the team of six, there's now a new message for England. Stay safe, stay well and stay local from all of us here. Bye bye.